For a very long time, Russia had a very peculiar relationship with Europe. Till the middle of the 17th century, Russia had virtually no place in the European theater, neither in the social nor cultural and definitely not in the political arena. Stretching between the rivers Don on the west and the Asiatic coast of the Siberia on the Pacific Ocean to the east, Russia ruled over a land, a geographical expanse, which was larger than the whole of Europe put together. And even though Russia was always looking at Europe, Europe was never looking back at her. Russia was, for Europe, essentially an Asiatic empire, ruling over the vast Asiatic hordes, over the stretch of Siberian plains and the, uh, and, and the regions bordering the Central Asian area, what is today Central Asia. For Europe, Russia did not even matter. Russia, however, always considered itself as distinct from the Asiatic people it ruled over. And from the days of Peter the Great in the middle of the 17th century, Russia began a deliberate encounter with Europe with an aim to integrate itself in the European scheme of things. During the periods of Peter the Great and his successors like Tsarina Catherine II, spanning over a century and a half, Russia steadily imposed itself almost on the political theater of Europe. By the end of the 18th century, Russia was more or less considered as an Asiatic kingdom which had some standing in European politics. The real change begins essentially in the 19th century as the revolutionary turmoil began to affect Western Europe with the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. Russia was almost sucked into the European theater of politics. Russia emerged as one of the leading protagonists of the monarchical structure in European politics in the early 19th century. And under Alexander I and then Nicholas I became the principal conservative bastion of European monarchy. The course of the history of Russia in the 19th century clearly indicates a very deliberate attempt at Europeanization. Russia was becoming more and more integral to Europe, fulfilling almost the dream that Peter the Great had a century and a half before that. But the problem of growing integration of Russia in the European scheme of things was that Russia had to change. The structure that Russia had inherited from its Mongol overlords of three and more centuries in the past had to gradually make way for the new Europe that was emerging in the 19th century with its emergence of industrial societies and the birth of what we call modern polity. The history of the 19th century of Russia is essentially therefore the tussle between the urge for reform and the drive for revolution. The question that Russia had to encounter was whether the Russian state was to reform itself or was it to be reformed by revolution. The story of the 19th century Russia essentially begins with the Napoleonic encounter and the, and the reforms that it had imposed uh, on Russia. In a curious way, as Napoleon, the revolutionary on horseback, the child of the revolution, began to export revolution from 1799 onwards, all the European states had necessarily to engage with that process of change. There were areas where Napoleon enforced the change is personally. In other areas, the need to resist Napoleon required governmental reforms. Russia actually happened to be of the latter sort. Confronted with the prospect of military defeat early in the 19th century, and then the real outcome of the Battle of Friedland and the Treaty of Tilsit marking the defeat and a temporary eclipse of Russian power, brought about the urge to change in the Russian state much more forcefully than anything else ever had since the days of Peter the Great. The Russian state that Alexander I had inherited from Peter and Catherine was a very 
curious, it was, a, was an anomalous feature in European politics. Because the dominant trends and dominant patterns of Russian politics, of Russian monarchy, was a direct inheritance of the Mongol overlords. The Mongols, when they used to rule over European Russia, had a very authoritarian structure imposed up among the Russian regions. So the Russian overlords, the boyars, could be decimated almost overnight at the slightest hint of suspicion and betrayal on part of the boyars. When the European Russia came off its own as ethnic Russians began to rule over the vast expanse of the Russian Empire, from the days of Ivan the Terrible, the Russians themselves tried the same old practice in order to ensure absolute loyalty among uh, its subjects. As a result, whole generations of Russian nobility would be deflowered and removed and replaced by new uh, nobility whenever there was a change of guard at their very top or whenever the ruler had reason to suspect the boyars. Any rights of property, legal defense of property vis-a-vis -vis the power of the monarch was untenable, unlike in Western Europe and Central Europe, where private property and feudal property was guaranteed by law, which even the king could not violate. In Russia, the authoritarian position of the Tsar guaranteed the fact that all property was held at the volition, at the discretion of the Tsar. So all feudal aristocrats essentially owed full allegiance to the overlord, to the Tsar, in order to enjoy whatever landed property they had. Technically, in Russia, all land belonged to the Tsar. The nobility, whenever uh, it came into being, came into being basically as a grace of the Tsar himself. The Tsar assigned huge landed estates to the boyars who would collect the revenue and then basically remit it at the, or put it at the disposal of the state. So power flowed in Russia right down from the Tsar himself. There were no ministerial councils, no ministries, no bureaucracy, no institutionalized bureaucracy till the beginning of the 19th century. And these traditional Asiatic governmental modes had to change when confronted with the challenge that Napoleon posed. In Russia, there was an awareness that institutionalized reforms had to be escalated in their pace for it to enable Russia to take on the challenge of Napoleon. It was in this light that in 1809 began the first institutionalized reforms of the 19th century under the minister Speransky. Speransky suggested that the very rigid centripetal character of the Russian state had to make way by devolving more and more power to the aristocrats at the provincial and at the local levels so that there could be effective governance without, encounter, without burdening the Tsar or the central government excessively. Speransky also suggested that ministries should be created and ministerial portfolios should be assigned to individual ministers with specific responsibility for certain areas of governance. Unlike the previous practice, when ministers were given charge on a case-by-case -case basis rather than on a field-by-field -field basis. There was the churning that this Speransky reforms had generated in the Russian state, of course, invited a backlash. And powerful aristocrats like Stroganov came out in opposition to the Speransky reforms. And when the Speransky reforms were halted because of Napoleonic invasion of Russia in 1812, and the reverses that Napoleon faced, and his final defeat in 1814 and 15, this was taken by the conservatives as a vindication of the old order. And people like Stroganov made the case then no further reform of the state need be instituted because the old order was perfectly capable of saving itself. <music> Tsar Alexander I emerged as the principal voice of conservatism in European politics after the fall of Napoleon. 
After a brief experiment with reforms, therefore, the Russian state was trying to stop the clock rather than pour it forward. There were, however, people inside the Russian establishment who were uncertain, who were unsure about the stoppage of reforms. There was a group of Russian military officers of bureaucratic and aristocratic origins who were exposed to the French and the German um, intellectual and cultural arena. And they were of the opinion that if the Russian Empire had to last over a long period of time, then the Russian state had not only to be reformed, it had to be reformed along Western lines, it had to be modernized along the lines of the rest of Europe. And this group of patriots of the fatherland came forth with a major reform agenda. They were, they even tried to stake out, to take out an uprising uh, against the Tsarist order demanding for reforms and upon its failure in uh, 1820, the society of the fatherland split into two. There was a northern society led by military officers with a more moderate political agenda and there was a southern society led by military officers such as Pavel Pastel with a more radical agenda. While the northern society was keen on bringing constitutional monarchy into Russia with an elected legislature and an accountable executive. The southern society, by contrast, was wishing to bring down the Tsarist order altogether and replace it with a republic. The first possibilities of change emerged when the very conservative Alexander I died and was about to leave open the question of succession to between to his two brothers, the more liberal Constantine and the more conservative reactionary Nicholas. Constantine, who was the second in line, who was the younger brother to Alexander I, was unwilling to become the Tsar for personal reasons. And that meant the succession had to go to Nicholas I. Now the members of the Northern Society wanted to see Constantine in power because with him they thought was the best opportunity for change for Russia. So when Constantine turned it down and Nicholas was due for succession, the reform-minded officers of the Northern Society broke out in an uprising. They refused to swear allegiance to Nicholas and they demanded institution, the promulgation and institution of a constitutional order. This happened in the month of December of 1825 and this is therefore known as the Decembrist Uprising. The reform-minded members of the Northern Society were, very, were known as very loyal and capable officers. So Nicholas did not immediately go the way of forcible suppression. But when the envoy of the Tsar was killed by the members of the Northern Society, Nicholas lost his calm and undertook a policy of brutal suppression. When the news of the suppression reached the South, the Southern Society, led by Pavel Pestel, rose up in arms, virtually in an act of self-defense. But the outcome of it was the suppression that had started with the North affected the South, and the entire Decembrist uprising was stamped to the ground. The top five leaders of the Decembrist uprising were executed, and the rest of the leadership were put under house arrest in Siberia. And for a generation or so, the voices of reformist politics had to be silenced. Nicholas I, having come to power and then immediately being confronted with the Decembrist uprising, was deliberately pushing a conservative agenda for the rest of his life. To start with, he was a conservative. Given the experience of the Decembrist, Decembrist uprising afterwards, Nicholas had no sympathy for the reformists. Nicholas believed that going the path of reform would ultimately undermine the Russian state and the stability of the Tsarist order. One of the major changes that resulted from this change of posture was very simple. Till the days of Alexander I, when a Russian aristocrat, uh, what is known as a Dvorian, and a Russian bureaucrat 
people from Chinovniki families were to go for higher education and training overseas, they would invariably be going to France. Even after the French Revolution, the natural seat of higher education for a Russian tended to be France. Under Nicholas I, this policy began to change. People of aristocratic and bureaucratic origins were no longer allowed to go to places where revolutionary ideas were doing the rounds. So neither France nor Britain was open to them anymore. They were sent instead to a more conservative center of law or conservative centers of learning in Germany. So by the mid 30s, although Nicholas himself was no longer was not in favor of reform and neither were in any of the top uh, level of a uh, top league of uh, Nicholas's ministers, a group or uh, two groups basically began to emerge in uh, the Russian establishment that began to favor reform. The first group led by people like Alexander Herzen and Bakunin, Mikhail Bakunin, began to argue that the Russian state needed to be reformed entirely along Western lines, that the Russian state must become in its entirety from its apparatus right down to the social and political structures, almost a replica of whatever was happening in Europe. These were known as the Westernizers. There were others such as the Aksakov brothers, such as the Kiryevsky brothers, such as Alexei Komyakov and Yuri Samarin, who believed that indeed the Russian state needed reform very, very badly. Nevertheless, they believed that Russia should be reformed along the lines, institutional character and the history of the kingdom of Russia itself rather than importing ideas from the West. Despite such powerful voices for reform among the junior ranks of the Russian bureaucrats and military officials, however, the Russian state did not feel the urge to change under Nicholas the first. If one reason had been Nicholas's personal aversion to the idea of reform as a result of the Decembrist uprising, there was also this other fact that there was at that point of time very little need being perceived for change. Because if one looks at the performance of the Russian state, its growing influence in European politics, the need for change did not really appear very uh, prominent. Because Russia had been in the forefront of the forces that led to the defeat of Napoleon. Russia was in the heart of conservative monarchies in Europe. Russia had bolstered the concert of Europe that had come up in the 1820s and 30s. It had stamped out liberalism and helped Eastern European powers, such as Austria-Hungary, uh, to stamp out liberal, the forces of liberalism in Europe. Russia was at the height of its military powers. There was not a single military reverse for the duration of Nicholas's reign till we come to the Crimean War. It was in fact the Russian defeat at the Crimean War that first brought home the necessity, the urgency for reform of the Russian state. Because while Russia was contesting with Europe, with Asiatic powers, Russian military superiority was unquestionable. And therefore, Nicholas I, given his personal aversion, saw no institutional reason either for any systematic overhauling. However, Russia's defeat in the Crimean War, and the Crimean War, when it began, was basically a Russo-Turkish affair. And at that stage, Russia was doing pretty fine. But Russia defeated the Crimean War, coming once France and England intervened, changed the total complexion of Russia's assessment of her own strength. Because in 1856, once the war was over, this was the most decisive defeat Russia had faced in over a two centuries. So Russia was confronted with the need to understand what went wrong. And the basic diagnosis had been that the intervention of powerful economic entities like France and England on behalf of the Ottoman Turkish Empire was the decisive factor and that Russia was actually in no position to contest the power of France and England effectively. Because these were industrial economies, which were powered by technological advancements such as railways, which allowed swift transportation of troops from one part of Europe to another, while Russia failed to 
do the same inside the kingdom. This made Russia feel the urgency of change in order to remain a viable imperial formation. Very conveniently for Russia, at this time, the, the Tsar Nicholas for the first himself also died. And his successor, Tsar Alexander II, was much more open to the idea of reform. Tsar Alexander II believed that it was useful to reform from above before the people brought about changes from below. One of the defining moments in Russian history came, therefore, in 1861, when the Tsar launched what is known as the Emancipation Edict. It had been identified that the principal reason of Russian economic backwardness had been the condition of the Russian agriculturists who lived in a state of serf. And being in a state of serfdom where between a half and a third of all their produce tended to be taken away by the landlords and the state, the people had very little urgency to, uh, to, bring, uh, to bring about an increase in production either. As a result, the agricultural productivity in Russia sagged also. Being serfs, these people were unable to move away from the land on which they were operating. So there was no mobility of labor, so industrialization was not possible either. It was to undo this particular predicament that the Emancipation Edict was launched in 1861. Nikolai Milutin, the minister of the deputy minister of the interior, went ahead and broke the shackles of served. In order to make sure that the serfs do not re get reduced to the status of bonded agricultural laborers, Milutin went ahead with a redistribution of land so that a large part of the land which used to belong to the, to the landlord would now come over to the mir, the village commune, which would then allocate the responsibility of cultivation uh, to the various uh, landholding families, uh, to the various cult peasant families. The, comp the, the landlords, in order to uh, ensure their compliance, have, would be compensated. The compensation was paid right away by the Russian state, 75% of which was to be in um, state securities. And the peasants who had been emancipated were required to pay for the cost of that redemption over a period of 49 years through a revenue obligation. As a consequence, there was suddenly the emergence of a labor market in Russia. It was largely this factor that led to the st increasing stagnation of the Russian economy, which could, be st which could be resolved only by the Stolypin reforms of the early 20th century. But the great reforms of Tsar Alexander II was not l confined only to the abolition of serfdom. He also began to introduce a, a form of local self-government. So alongside the Mir, which was administering the village itself, there were a cluster of mayors coming, uh, uh, known as the Volost, which were given a zemstva, a council, which was to govern uh, and address needs of education, health, and the day-to-day -day task of administration. Some of these were, to, were elective bodies. Some of these were uh, bodies sort of nominated by the elected bodies. So you have the Zemskaya Sobrania, which was an elected body, elected by the people themselves which would then elect a board, an executive board, known as the Zemskoya Uvarova, which would uh, ultimately carry on the day-to-day -day task of administration at the local level. The Tsar also, alongside this uh, reform of the local government apparatus, brought about a reform of the judiciary, as a result of which there was an integration of the entire juridical structure uh, in Russia. And there he introduced reforms such as Western practices of trial by jury and trial by lawyers. It is said that the real beneficiary of the reforms of the Russian system in the 1860s was the central government itself, was the Tsarist order itself. The change of the local government apparatus simply meant that the landlord's representatives, the Espravnik, would no longer be in charge of local government. It would now be the officials of the Tsar working together with representatives 
of the of the of the local self government the people uh, of the regions of the volost and of the zemstva so by the second half of the 19th century the russian state had been transformed within a span of essentially 20 years the period of alexander the second was a period of great reform initiative by which the major problem about how to change the russian state in line with europe had been resolved there were however problems and once alexander the second was assassinated by a group of more radical thinkers called the nihilists the russian state was suddenly confronted with the urge to hold back on reform it is at this stage that revolutionary thinking began to emerge in the russian society mm -hmm.